Hello, everybody. You missed the best part of the whole trip. Just a hard slog. We are halfway to Puddle Lake. My original subscribers will know exactly what I mean by Puddle Lake. We came up two years ago now? Yep. Two years ago, we came up the creek bottom uh, in the spring. We basically navigated the whole uh, creek. It was complete blowdowns. We dragged canoes all the way through because there's no trail to this lake. It's basically a confluence of a creek, uh, forms into a lake with a very deep bottom, which is a perfect habitat for brook trout. We know the creek has brook trout. Uh, we know the lake is actually basically just a pond, uh, but a, a large size pond, but a small size lake for this area. Uh, what we say, it's kind of glacier carved, spring fed, cold water, which is ideal for brook trout. Very steep sided. Yeah. Very steep banks on both sides. It drops down into really deep bottom. I think it's 100 foot we marked last year, which is insane for a lake of this size. Uh, so go back, or don't go back actually, because I'm gonna repost the Puddle Lake Adventure. It's on film on my old camera, so you're gonna have to get used to the low frame, frame rate, the low quality, but I think it tells a great story. So I'm gonna repost that in full, uh, I think after the adventure. So like I say, we're about halfway, uh, navigating clear through the bush using an old map. Uh, Jeremy's got, he's eating some salmon, which is kind of weird, but... Are you something? <laughs> a big handful of salmon. You gotta eat the skin, right? Oh, they didn't scale it very well. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, watch out for... Uh, we're gonna do a big Easter egg hunt. I have a whole pile of different things you're gonna have to look for throughout the video. They're gonna be hidden all over the place. So keep your eye for that. Uh, we'll talk about a prize later on because I haven't secured a prize yet, but I'll get something, hopefully. And uh, the winner will be the person who first gets all of the different um, Easter eggs throughout. And you have to do it in a certain way. So I'm going to go over details and that's going to probably be at the end of the video. So you're going to have to watch this. Probably going to be two parts because we're going to be doing two nights uh, hot tents here. So did they miss anything? It's a lot of stuff, huh? No, we're cooking stuff. We're catching stuff. Yeah. We're burning a lot of calories. Piles of calories. This is, it's insane to go out here and do this. It's really crazy. It's, uh, it's, we're not going to probably give it the serv uh, the, the uh, attention it needs as how difficult it is to get to this lake. But like I said, this is no trail. So we're basically going up. We just did a big hill and uh, we've got, we're only halfway and we're what, three, two hours in now? Two hours in. Two hours in. So four hours total of just raw slog, pulling really heavy uh, sleds all the way in. So anyway, let's get moving. When you're done your salmon. Yep. <laughs> yes, I didn't eat breakfast. He's all going, uh, what do you call that? Interm intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting still. So I did a video on that not too long ago. But, and Jared did too. He said uh, hunter-gatherer diet on his uh, his channel, which is something you might be interested in going to check out. All right. We'll get moving after this. Yep. See if I can pull this while I film. <sighs> oh. It's one of the easier spots, one of the easier spots to navigate. At least bush-wise, because it's more open. We went through some pretty nasty stuff. Huh. Jeremy's up ahead breaking trail. Let's get hung up on everything. Huh.
and you want to feel your legs burn, this is the way to do it. I gotta put the camera away. Those hills are not fun. You like those hills, Jay? Caught up in my rope. You can't even get up there with snowshoes on. No, not enough uh, grip for the weight of sled that I've got. These actually, I think, work better because they've got a toe grip. You can kind of grip in, crawl up the hill. Yeah. Not with those, the old style. No. Oh, so once we get up over this hill, well, it's supposed to be flat back there, but that didn't happen. <laughs> I forgot about this one. You forgot, you forgot about this hill. <laughs> it's supposed to be flat somewhere, and then we're supposed to be able to... Well, we're gonna we're up on the ridge because there's a big ridge before it drops off to the lake. So what we got to do is get over the ridge, and then kind of scoop in on the inlet part of the creek. And we have to make sure we don't go too far up the lake, or else we'll end up at the big ridge, and we can't get down to the lake through the big ridge. We can, but it would be very unsafe to do so. Uh -huh. uh, so much, uh, so much effort, so much work on the legs, eh? Quads, everything. <laughs> Yeah, feel it in your quads? Yeah. You still well, on my the top of my hips too from that belt, right? Like Yeah. Well the rope on me, I've only got the rope around my waist and it cuts in. Yeah. So that's not fun. Yeah, the the width on the belt makes a big difference I find. Yeah, you got a it's two inches, right? Full harness set up. Yeah. Out of what's that P V C pipe or uh it's, kind of pipe? it's electrical conduit. Uh I don't know. Anyway, what did you Schedule do? Schedule 40 PVC. And you put some screws, some welded screws, or some heated up screws with an eyelet, jammed yeah. it in there? You melted gonna, the nuts. You gonna make a video on that or no? I probably will. Maybe. This is the test run, so if it works, I'll... Uh, right, yeah, it's so far hasn't break, broken. The last one you made out of wood broke, right? Yeah. It lasted a bunch of trips and then it snapped. These ones are more flexible, eh? So yeah. what happened on the other ones is the sled pushed down and they broke that way. Yeah. But these have so much give. I just can't believe that these nuts which I just heated up and pushed in basically are holding the weight of that sled yeah and it's a heavy sled going up the hill where it's so heavy I'm like crawling to <laughs> yeah you'll have to make a video so yep. and I'll have to link the guy whose video I watched to uh yeah two fully loaded sleds right to the brink they're not light either nope. so you, you still think we're only halfway oh, that. <laughs> really well I was trying to get a signal but I'm not sure. GPS is useless. Yeah. Because you don't get a signal where you need it. So what's the secret navigating in the woods? Cell Having phone. ten thousand different items. Yep. G GPS. Uh analog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People who don't know analog is Mix. Like, that's the analog. Compass. Compass. The map. Yeah, we got a map, we got everything. And then just the bird's eye view for yeah. a little bit of uh yeah, confirmation. Actually, we can see there's a ridge top way over here and then it plummets right over the hill so we know that's either the creek um or lake uh puddle lake jimmy has been using his cell phone too because he's not getting service with the gps so yeah. <sighs> that's the thing about gps as soon as you need it it doesn't work it's garbage so you can't rely on them um but it's hard, it'd be hard for us to get lost since we can basically walk back on the same path we took and we have everything we need for probably for four or five days living comfortably and then <laughs> and then maybe another three weeks of starvation so definitely people can come find us worst case it says puddle lake is right there it says it's right there eh three more hours <laughs> <laughs> it better not be we'll be there by noon yeah so how long did we be there in a couple hours maybe yeah it's five uh, hours four hours three hours so far three hours so if you think you can do that you're welcome to come out to puddle lake and join us <laughs> if we'll tell you where it is. Yeah. <laughs> if we catch a three pound fish, we're not going to ever tell anybody where it is. No. <laughs> if we catch a bunch of perch, well, maybe one day we'll let somebody else know. <laughs> Alright, so over the ridge. Yep. Over the ridge, down the valley, down the lake, catch fish, have a good time. All that good stuff. Yeah, wildernessy. There's no sounds, there's no engine noise, no nothing. And it's whisper quiet out here too because there's not a there's hardly any breeze, no wind. 
It's a perfect trout fish fishing weather. Yeah, the Overcast. Birds, the birds all stop. Yeah, I don't find I hear very many birds in the deep woods though. If you really listen, well, there's a lot more birds in the city than there are out here in the woods. It's when we were close to that creek, we heard a whole bunch of them, right? Yeah, by the there creek, because there's more there's more life by the, the creek than there is, you know, in open hardwood, especially in the winter. There's no tracks, there's no deer tracks, no rabbit tracks. Uh, we saw a couple wolf tracks. Yep. That was it. And there's nothing out here, man. People think there's nature and it's like abundance, but pure nature, overgrown, nothing. We've seen two squirrels all day. Yeah. Two little red squirrels and that's it. Yeah, Plus we're scaring everything away, but not that that matters. There's no tracks on the ground, so no. they're not here. <laughs> the sled's only fallen over twice. Both times when I set up the camera. And every time I do it, set up the camera, I'm paying attention to the camera, I'm trying to make it smooth. I hit a stupid tree. I'm bound up on a tree. Oh. And it's the only stupid tree in the way. So if you can see down the valley, that's the opposite side of Puddle Lake. So we gotta go down the valley, there's a little pond, and then the creek's running that way. So we're, Jeremy figures we're about 85% of the way there. <laughs> yeah. If we're being specific. And it's been a little bit less than four hours. <laughs> it's not too bad. No. No, just four hours of pure slog. Yeah. It's a lot like dragging those canoes. <laughs> In yeah, the spring. we thought it would be easier than doing the spring journey with the canoes, dragging it, slogging it through probably about the same length of time, to be honest, through the creek. Um, and this isn't much different. So, <laughs> about the same. We were talking about maybe doing a spring trip because there's actually a canoe cache, a canoe cache for people who are not Canadian is basically you leave a boat at a lake and uh, it's apparently it's it's legal to do that um, so yeah people drop boats back in these back lakes so they don't have to obviously carry it back every single time so it's pretty common for more productive lakes the lake trout lakes and stuff like that way way out and I'll leave a boat there so anyway we did find a canoe back here two canoes actually but one was completely out of commission broken by uh Probably 40 years old yeah 40 years old the other one was obviously a newer one as a sports pal like mine and uh, it was in better shape than mine actually so maybe we'll bring some paddles back try it in the spring again it'll be fun we're almost there it'd be nice to take a break we're not really oh, gonna get a break though <laughs> <laughs> we got more work to do we gotta cut wood set up a tent clear a spot out but we weren't planning on fishing today Today was just a travel day. Today was just a day if we thought we could make it. We had lots of backup plans where we'd <laughs> have these other lakes we could come out and just go drive to, Stock Lake. So the fact that we're even getting here is a little bit of a miracle. We made a wrong turn and we ended up, we wanted to cross over here and it's a big spring fed runoff. So it goes all the way down in the valley and it feeds into the creek system down here. I'm not going to show the drop off but it's uh, straight down 40 feet and you can actually hear water, so that would be spring water and runoff. That would feed part of the creek system down there. And Jeremy since he was breaking trail is coming up the rear. We've been mostly in front so Almost there. <laughs> well, it's good to show some of the hard part of it. Yeah, a little bit of the hard part. It's mostly all hard. Yeah. So what are you saying about your poles? No. Oh. I'm surprised they've held up, but the trouble is going down hills, they, they bend too much. So my sled just goes wherever it wants. Yeah. 
I don't know if I can stiffen them up by putting dowels inside of them, but I've got a little bit of a different problem. My string is or my rope's probably too long, and uh, because I've got the um, tracks on there, it wants to go straight. So if I want to turn around a bend, it basically hits the tree. So the rope will probably shrink shrink up. So thanks to all you guys down below for all the suggestions about shrinking the rope. It's coming in handy. I'm actually going to do it when I get to camp. <laughs> Because you know you guys are going to leave coming, shrink your rope, you won't get caught in the trees. But that's not the only problem. The problem is we're going zigzaggy the whole way to make a trail because there isn't one. So it's nothing straight line. And the tracks on my, my uh, sled are making it want to go straight so I can't bend around the corners. Yeah. Although it will be easier if I shrink the string or the rope a little bit. But We both have a perfect setup for a lake pole. Yeah, but straight not, go. Not a bush pole. No, Th then the long rope means you don't carry a lot of weight on yourself. You just pull it horizontally and the ground pole carries the weight whereas if you have it a short rope um it, it go up, going up the hills you're pretty much carrying it the whole way right there's no give whereas the rope i can decide if i want to let it at the bottom and pull it up with my arms which does come in handy seems like we're never going to get there this hill's not fun put it that way <laughs> jeremy's still halfway up because i basically sat on my sled and coasted down very carefully though, if you're going to do it, very carefully. It's about risk management at this point. We are four kilometers away from help. We'd have to uh, pray on a signal, climb a hill, pray on a signal, call on a chopper to land on the lake. That's basically our rescue, our out. So uh, in other words, there's no injuries today, none. Shit, now I got to find something to knock on. Knock on wood. All right, so Jerry's still up the hill. He's having a harder time because he doesn't have a rope. So there's pros and cons to both systems, right? Jeremy is right there. So he doesn't have that benefit of using the rope to control the sled as it comes down the hill. Let's see if we can find him in the bushes. Where is he? There he is. So he's going to take his time and I have no problems with him taking his time because I don't want to have to carry a human being out. In fact, I probably couldn't. It's just not feasible. And the last thing you want to do is rush somebody in a condition like this and there's a good reason we're in pairs too. There's no way this is a solo trip. Hey, the first man-made sound. Got a airplane. So we don't, uh, when we're coming in, we make sure to hold up for the next person. And I'm calling back all the time, seeing if he's all right. So if something does happen, uh, we're not separated by a big distance. Anyway, we're almost there. Still almost there. I'll, I'll be glad to be done with this hill. You think like going downhill is easy? <laughs> it's harder actually. Well, I wouldn't say harder. It's about equally as hard going down the hill as going up. Because you have to, you can't just let the sled go. End up with smashed up sled and on the on the wrong line too. So we have to control it going down. And like they say, there's no path. So, you know, your sled's just going to end up where it ends up, which might be like against a boulder or something else. <laughs> you took your pokes, pokes things off. Okay. Hey. What do you call those things? The poke poles? Po poke poles, yeah. I took them off. Yeah, not working? I couldn't control it going the hills. So. Yeah, I was just talking about that, how it's harder to control. So pros and cons to both ways, right? We're going to have to do like six trips up that hill because we won't be able to pull our sleds up. <laughs> but it's going to be worth it, right? Well, that, that's what we hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many other lakes we could have gone to. We totally killed that tree. Someone's gonna be really upset. I think there's a forest of trees or anything, but you know, you didn't have to do that, Jeremy. I, it was an accident. Yeah, you're so bad. I was trying to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you'd have to carry me out. I was just talking about that too. Oh, yeah. Whatever. 
Whatever. Ten thousand bucks to get a helicopter. <laughs> Is that what it costs? Uh, ten or eighteen, I forget. For a, for a rescue? You don't have, uh, for a hello rescue? You don't have adventure insurance? Yeah, hello rescue is expensive. Then you have to pay for it yourself? Hello money, yeah. Really, eh? Well, you think what it costs just to go for a helicopter ride and then you throw a couple of paramedics in there? You know, for 20 grand, I'd crawl out. Would you? I think so. Yeah, I would, for 20 grand. For 20 grand. Five hours of slogging and we finally made to Puddle Lake. Finally. And it's just a little pond. Pond with promise. I'm gonna post that other video, you guys are gonna watch it. It's a really good representation of Canada. So I would urge you guys to go on Google Maps or Google Earth, find North Bay on the map, and then go about two or three hours north of that and just check out the check out the topography and you'll be amazed at what Canada has to offer as far as these little puddle lakes all over the place. And this one doesn't even have a name because it's not really been discovered. So uh, I think if we called in, we could probably get it named Pueblo Lake, but we're not. We're gonna keep this one a secret for us because there are so few secrets left as far as undiscovered, uncharted territories in Canada. So we're gonna keep this to ourselves. Jeremy, you just pulling up again? And we're gonna go across the lake and find our spot. So we're here, injury free? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 10,000 calories burned. At least. I don't know. How many hours? Uh, it's just past 12, so five. Five hours straight? But we didn't, we just didn't. Just under five. We didn't leave at eight. At seven. Seven? Seven to 12, five hours? Yeah, but we kind of took some breaks. Well, I mean, yeah. that's five hours. Five hours is five hours. How long it took? Oh, I burnt 3,000 calories already. Did you? Apparently. You notice that? <laughs> Halfway through I believe day. that. All right, let's go find a spot and take a break. Yeah, find out what these tracks are. Yeah. We're not alone. No. Wolf, maybe. So we uh, decided we're going to camp on the lake, which might turn into a disaster, but might turn into a good benefit too, because we're going to be setting up exactly where we were getting most of the fish, most of the fish, which is the outlet here. So we've come across the lake just to set up. Uh, so we can basically do everything all at the same time, put a punch a, punch a bunch of holes around the, the tent here, hang out here, and if this doesn't work, we can try other places. The lake's not very big, so it shouldn't be hard to find the fish if they're here, if they're biting. So I'm gonna shovel out behind me here. Uh, Jeremy looks like he's got the ice auger almost filed up, fired up. And think about fishing, as I always say, it's lying in the water. So the longer you have your line in the water, the better chance you have catching fish. So we're gonna set lines right away and uh, let our lines do the work for us. So I'm gonna shovel. Looks like Jeremy might punch a couple holes and uh, we'll get those tip-ups rigged up. And I need a snack too, I'm hungry. That's funny, there's so much ice that Jerry ran out of, uh, ran out of auger. How much ice you got? Not that much. A whole auger. <laughs> I'm not going to put my arm down to find out. <laughs> Might have a nap though. <laughs> oh, it'd be funny if we caught a fish right away though. What's that? It'd be funny if we caught a fish right away. Yeah. We've got one line set here so far. Just a little chub minnow on uh, just a plain J hook, that's it. And how these uh, tip ups work is when they go down, I can adjust these too so I can let the fish run. You usually hear the uh, line come down and you know you have a fish because it stays down and it gives it a little bit of slack for the trout, which they like. And there's not a lot of tension at the end here. So they can grab it and run a little bit. That's it, one line in. We got three more to go, so two each. I got it halfway for you. 
Halfway, eh? That's it? Yeah. It's lazy. Ooh. That's the whole auger. Ten feet. Yeah. What was the other one? Ten feet. Well, this one I don't know. We want to be in about ten feet. Yeah. The other one was quite a bit more than that. We're not skunked. Hey. We're not skunked. Hey. Little guy, but that's what we're here for. The natural little guys on the little minnow. Now we can go home. It's been all worthwhile, guys. A little natural brookie. All right, so I've never set this hot tent up before. I've never slept in a hot tent before. It's the first time ever. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm sure there's a learning curve like everything on every, every skill you learn, there's a learning curve. So we'll see how this goes. I'm gonna try to do it by myself. Uh, I might need some help with the tent part of it. Uh, Jeremy's just off grabbing some brush for uh, the stove and some uh, spruce boughs for the bedding because we're going to be camping on the ice, we want to get up above a little bit. Just, I'm not going crazy, I'm actually checking the fishing lines as I'm talking here. Okay, let's get this set up. There he goes, he was too small. Is it a brookie? Yeah. Mm. I'll wait for him. Oh, he's still here. <laughs> Is he? That's funny. He's right. Got me slush here. Grab him! <laughs> yeah. Maybe, eh? Grab him! Oh, I felt him. Get him! Oh, get him! <laughs> oh, jeez. <yeah. laughs> Did he go down? I think so. Yeah, he's a little guy. <laughs> So, and the rest of these just kind of nest like that. So, 
so, like so. There we go. I almost forgot to put the legs up. So by the time you set everything up, there's not a ton of space. It's supposed to be a three-man tent. You can put like one guy along the back, one guy on this side, and that's pretty much it. I mean, if you had a kid, you could probably fit a kid in here too, but it's not a massive structure. It's basically enough just to get the kind of job done. Um, but it's a whole of a lot better than, you know, cold tenting it. A hot tent is definitely an asset, especially if it gets really cold. Um, not expecting to get cold this time around, but... Uh, you never know we've had temperatures down to minus 40 degrees celsius whereas here we're not hovering around zero and zero is a freezing point so minus 40 is pretty darn cold yeah, see the finished stove just hold up held up by uh, a couple pieces of wood and the bottom skirt here all i did was throw some snow on there and that'll keep the draft down so that's it all ready to go and Jeremy is working on a little spruce ball bed as part of the Easter egg hunt you got the Easter bunny and the answer is one because I only caught one and we didn't set any snares coming in there's actually very little activity as far as uh, snowshoe hair so the answer is one one snowshoe hair I always feel like it's more homey when you got some meat hanging outside the camp. For some reason it just makes me think that it's camping time. I actually brought some goat in. Who brings goat in when they're going winter camping? We do. We brought goat. I got a front shoulder and Two racks of ribs. So we're gonna eat some goat. That'd be a good trick. Get a, a goat. Bring a live goat out here? Yeah, one that pulls our sleds and then we eat it. And then we eat it. <laughs> the donkey. Yeah. Can't be picky though. Such a fancy YouTuber. Not really. Yeah, first light. Yep. Breaking in the hot tent. Did you do bojo fire? Yeah. <laughs> I used to, I didn't really have a good bearing block, so I used my forehead. Works. Yeah, it makes you a little bit dizzy though. Pretty fancy work. Yeah. Getting there. Getting there. Another one. We should we should boil a little bit of water for drinking, eh? Yeah. I was thinking even just to put my cup on there with some lake water. 
maybe bring back some hemlock branches for a tea. I've talked about how fresh our lakes are, but all this is really good drinking water, but it should be boiled first. All we're doing is grabbing this boughs here to make a bed. Just enough to get off the uh, ice in case there's a little bit of slush forming. And obviously we don't want to be sitting in slush or sleeping in slush, that's even worse. So we'll just grab a few from each tree and uh, not too many from the same tree and it'll be fine. The lower branches don't get as much sunlight as the top anyway, so taking the lower ones aren't going to bother the tree that much. So Jer's outside messing around with the goat. We're gonna have some goat stew. Everybody asks us why we stew everything. Well, the reason we stew everything because it's easier. It's easy to stew a goat. All you do is cut it up in little pieces, chunk it up. We'll throw some rice in there. We've got some carrots. We'll throw some spice in there. We got broth, liquid, salt, flavor, spices, everything. And the best thing about it is it's gonna tenderize. We don't have to mess around about temperature and all that gross work stuff that you have to do when you bake it. We don't just don't have the technology here to bake. We don't want to bring a you know, Dutch oven was out of the question. So stew as it is, stew as it is. Uh, so I've got my sleep system set up here. I've got this uh, pretty heavy duty foam. It's about inch and a quarter, I would say. Pretty thick stuff. I uh, got this from Army Surplus. Uh, so that's going to be my bottom base layer. Uh, we have a little bit of slush forming in here, but we've got a good layer of uh, spruce that uh, Jeremy's put together. So that show, that'll be the main bottom base to keep everything dry, plus this. I don't imagine the water is going to get up that high. It's going to start to leak out the sides anyway. So we're going to go this. Then I have an inflatable air mattress. Um, that's the uh, thermal rest and then I have two sleeping bags. I have a summer bag and then I have a uh, duvet style down bag. But the down bag can't get wet. If it gets wet it's useless but the summer bag uh, in combination with the duvet style um, with the uh, fe uh, feathers in it or goose down feather will be perfect for this. So I'm going to lay this out and then I'm going to throw my insulated uh, thermorest on top. On top of that, we're gonna put the thermorest. So this we just blow up. So I'll have, you know, a good air space, air cushion, rubber in combination with air. So I'll have the best of all, both worlds. So a thermorest basically is just a nozzle and blow that up. Folds out, packs up nice and small. So I've got a summer bag in here with dry clothes. 
and I'll change obviously before I go to sleep. I'm not going to change before that because it's not crucial that I'm uh, dry right now. Um, fairly warm and active, but I do want to have dry clothes to sleep in. So I'll leave that here. I'm not going to open that yet because I don't need to. And then these are both dry bags. Dry bag, dry bag. So worst case scenario, I could, if you know, if I got really wet and damp, I could take all my clothes off and jump in a sleeping bag and I would be totally fine because this stuff is good to really low temperatures. I think this bag here is good to about minus, you know, 10 degrees Celsius and the combination with the summer bag would probably good for minus, you know, 20, 25, 30. So that's my sleep system. I'm not going to put it together just yet. I'll just throw our two little speckled trout here up on our trophy pole. There we go. How does that look? So if you're not sure where this goat came from, you have to dig back in some of my other videos. It's a gift from the farmer or maybe fair exchange is a better word. He um, needed to get rid of a goat and I was happy enough to butcher it. So. Jeremy's just uh, chunking it up for stew. It's all been brined, so basically I dumped it in some salt for about five days, and that'll help um, tenderize it. So it should be nice and not chewy. Yeah, fingers crossed. You did some research on charcuterie, didn't you? A little bit. A little bit. Salt does something to meat. When you mix the salt, it draws the blood out, and uh, it helps to tenderize it for some reason. It basically breaks the cells down and then takes the water out and then actually puts more water in. It's an interesting scientific process. But Yeah, because there's a couple different salts involved in charcuterie's use. So. Right. And I just used regular uh, seasoning salt actually. Nothing special. And it worked last time. So Seasoned salt or seasoning salt? Seasoning. <laughs> seasoning salt. So I, it's basically just salt with some garlic and some other flavors in it. So. And then I did uh, the regular wadobo spice. So we can add some of that in the stew. Jeremy's saying his hands are cold when they are cold. As soon as they get wet, they get cold, right? Yeah. There's something about your hands being wet. Well, obviously it transfers the heat or the, the cold quicker and easier, but. 28 you know, times faster. 28 times faster, yeah, I believe that. It's, uh, it's pretty brutal once your hands get wet and it's slimy. So we've got a, a, a towel over here, a rag I should say. and. Use that, dry your hands real quick. So, you know, especially if you get a fish slime. Yeah. That's probably what you're doing now too, right? Yep, fish slime. Well, we don't have a table in our tent, it's too small. You should try to figure a way to chuck the bones in there too, right? I guess. Yep, Draw take them apart at the uh, joints there and then yeah. maybe what I'll do is I'll cut some of them up after they've cooked partially. Sure. Like we did with that beaver. Yeah, that worked really well with the beaver. It did. That's a tricky joint to do, but this one should be easy. Yeah, we'll get all that bone marrow out, obviously. You know, it's a pretty heavy weight to be carrying around, but I mean, this is what people did before they had, you know, dehydrated food. Those uh, MRE bags and whatever else they buy at the camping store these days, but we like to do it a little bit more traditionally. So we huck in a goat leg and <laughs> yeah. pay, Salty goat. pay the price. Yeah, salty goat for sure. And the fat's actually really good on this too. Right? Okay, I was wondering. Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. It'll sh it should render down nice, we'll keep nicely. It in then. My mouth is watering. Oh yeah. Yeah, you guys at home who don't get used to uh, butchering your own animals, like it's something to to actually get to the point where you're butchering an animal and your mouth is watering. <clears throat> that's that's something most people don't get, right? You know what animal that never happens with? No. Chickens. Why? Because it's nothing about it. I don't know. There's something about them. They're just gross when you butcher them. You do not want to eat them. No? Then a little bit later you do. <laughs> Give it a day. Yeah, I, I used to be where I would... Where, uh, if I'm butchering a deer, I just want to have like somebody beside me cooking part of it on the... Oh, do you? On the fire while you're working, right? It just... Yeah. Well, I used to be at the point where I would, I would shoot a deer, I would clean it over the, the first week and I wouldn't touch it for two or three weeks because oh, yeah? it was just too vivid. Huh. You know, the gross parts of 
being a meat eater was, uh, you know, your, your brain has to forget that. But, you know, now I'm to the point where I can I could do a goat and eat it the same day. Yeah. You know, I probably where you're at now as far as the venison goes. You just, you know, you're hungry for it. Yeah. And now we've burned like 3,000 calories just walking in. Probably another two or three <laughs> running around nonstop all day, right? Yeah. I mean, you wanted to have a nap, but not happening. <laughs> oh, I wasn't really going to have a nap. Oh, I thought you were serious. It felt like it. There's too much to do. We yeah. wouldn't have got like all the branches for a bed or a firewood or. Oh, exactly. All right, so stew it is. Stop complaining that we do stew. We're just going to do stew because it's better. Why is it better? It's just more conducive to camp life. <laughs> it, is. it is better. It is, for sure. It's better. It's just better. You know, it's nice to mix it up, but it's better. People like to see meat kind of sizzling on the coals, though, eh? Is that... Yeah, but we don't have, like, piles of oil to do it. In the... We just don't have the, the pots and pans and... And the tension to sit there and pay and, and uh, mind it. Yeah. So that's why it happens. So in the stew pot she goes. Should be creeping up on the evening bite. This is the bite that every fisherman likes to wait out and see happen. So we'll see if we actually hit it. That's the nice thing about staying overnight. You might think it's a lot of work for, you know, we're up to three tiny trout. Uh, and it is a lot of work for two, three tiny trout, but it's more than, for people that live in Canada, it's more than, you know, three tiny trout. It's the whole experience. It's the whole nature thing that we have here. Um, you know, I don't know too many places in the world that have a, an outlet like this to visit, uh, you know, in their backyard. And people, you guys have been commenting all the time about all the things that you guys see and uh, I have to I guess I have to understand that maybe you don't see the same perspective like when we cut down trees and whatnot that this is a perfectly renewable resource here and we're not going to run out of trees anytime soon because we manage them on a what's called an 80-year cycle and it's meant to mirror what happens with forest fires so every in about 80 years the forest is totally recovered but if you leave the forest uh, get big it over crowds and um, it shelters the the lower brows, so it can't grow up and renew. So what the logging companies are doing now is actually clearing the forest out so that it can do that 80 year cycle. And then all sorts of new life springs up, animals start moving in like deer and moose and bear, you know, because the, the, the berries come in and the undergrowth comes back up and that's where the productivity is, the main productivity is in that lower section of the forest but if it has a big canopy the light can't get down you can't get uh, fruiting trees you can't get berries you know all those wild edibles that we know about don't exist in the deep forest like this because it's a huge canopy and the light doesn't get down low where it needs to go so anyway i think you if you guys keep continue to watch this you'll see what you know what canada has to offer and and how we can use the, the nature and the forest as a re renewable resource and the will be cut here is dead you know just because it burns better but there'll be no reason we couldn't cut live trees there's just there's no reason to cut live trees because like i say the dead stuff burns it's already pre-dried dead standing we find that stuff all the time and uh that's what we burn that's a nice warm fire now so all i'm doing is replenishing my water i always want to make sure there's some water on the boil here Always water on the go. Jeremy's got a little cup here on the go too. And I'm gonna refill my two liters so that in the morning when I wake up, I have water to drink. So far I like this setup. The tent's working good. Stove's working good. No big complaints. Weather's perfect. Um, tomorrow apparently is supposed to be nasty. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. We got like apparently wind and rain coming tomorrow. So. It might be a uh, might be a slow day, and uh, you know we're gonna hang out and rest in here. And we got a nice dry spot. No worries. Better than traveling on a day like that. That's for sure. You know, unless you're going out. But even then, you know, going out in the rain like that tomorrow, not good. So unlike in southern Ontario, most of the wood around here is pretty much softwood. 
uh, spruce, um, cedar, at least around the edges. You know, where we came from was all hardwood, but there's no way we're going up there to get wood. So we do with what we have. The spruce actually burns pretty good. I don't mind burning spruce. It's got a fair amount of resin in it. So we're burning maybe 10 inch logs. That's it. The stove really can probably take a 12. Maybe a little bit longer than that, but. There's a pretty good job heating that space, you know, just little logs like that. Get a good stack of those for tomorrow in case it's raining. And then we want a good stack overnight and then we want, you know, enough for cook a meal and breakfast or at least warm up that goat a bit for breakfast. That'll be nice. Jeremy found a dead tree way, way, way over there. He's hauling back, hopefully some bigger stuff. Doesn't seem like a very big lake, but it's a big size. He's going very slowly. He's tired. We're both tired. guys think you need power auger. This is power augering. <laughs> you want top? You do top. Sure. Yeah. Made in Canada, power auger. <laughs> Check out that view down there though. That's the outflow. It's so still here. Super calm. Power auger. <laughs> There's an otter track right on the bank there, eh? Yeah. He's using that open water to get underwater. No monsters yet, but we're working toward a meal. That's number four. Be nice if they're a little bit bigger than that though. Jeremy's gonna get skunked at this rate. That's four for the board.
little brookie. We want it. The six incher. Let him go. Jerry, you want this line or no? Oh, she's running. Same one. I'll let this one go too. Too small. At six, you want you want to not be skunked or you happy to be skunked or you want one? It'd be nice if you could wait a little bit longer, but if you get snagged, right? Yeah. You see it going to the branches. Yeah. I don't know. Hit it? Yeah. Small one? Yeah. Oh my, that's not so bad. That's a keeper for today. Yeah. There's a the hook. I stick your hand in there this time. We well, already have a cold hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> no sense us both having cold hands. Well, there can always be a three pounder lurking around. I think we mentioned before there's a hundred feet of water here. There's plenty of water for a big fish to lurk in. And this is the hole we just punched too. Bigger one. There you go, that's the best one so far. There we go. Not a monster still, but getting better. So we left three lines out. We took the one at the back out because it was um, probably get snagged and it's the most active line. So, and mostly they're small fish anyway, so it's not a big deal. The goat's looking good. Uh, we put rice in there and carrots. And we decided we might keep the door open at night. If it gets too hot, we might keep it open. And uh, But we're gonna close it for now to eat, and warm up and dry off and all that stuff and get the bed in and all that ready and get changed. It's nice and warm in here. It's like the perfect temperature, not too warm. You can see that. It goes, you can adjust the brightness. Can't do it with my one hand, but you adjust it by pushing up and down on there. How does that look? I'll do it against the tent. Maybe I won't. Anyway, turns off and on the same way. It's lighting this whole tent up. There we go. Look at that. Oh, we lost our light. And it's back on again. And we're blurry again. There we go, that's all better. You wouldn't have made it with your cot, man. I don't think so. We would have given up. I didn't think we were going to make it anyway, but then we just kind of kept a pace and we made it. We made it in all right time too. So that was pretty good. But a cot would be nice because it's also the same height as a chair. And it's totally worth it for those seven fish we caught. Yeah, totally. T tiny trout. I checked, I burned 6,000 calories so far. <laughs> yeah, just about according to Fitbit. There's a thousand calories in a trout, so if I eat six of them... <laughs> There's a thousand? <laughs> not the ones we caught. <laughs> it's always funny when you say you're going to eat goat. It's like, it's not really gourmet. It's like, we're going to eat goat tonight. Can't eat that whole pot? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Maybe. 
do it in rounds to wake up and yeah. couple, every couple hours and eat. <laughs> Set an alarm. You got to eat 6,000 calories. Yep. Just to make up for today, are you going to lose weight? I'm going to lose weight. How many how many pounds of body weight is that if you 6,000 calories? Approximately one and a third. A lot of it might be water loss too though. Like I might lose water too because I'm very dehydrated right now. Yeah. I only got a few tricks. This is what Canadians do. We got maple sugar, but this one's different. This is um, mint, wild mint. I collected it down by the pond near my house. I don't know if you'll see it or not, but it's... Let's read. Yeah, and it smells like mint. Like toothpaste. Yeah, Canadians are getting famous for another bag of green. <laughs> That's true. It does look like we're going to have a really good time tonight. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'll put those together and make some tea. I've been saving this for so long and try to figure out when to use it, but I don't really like hot drinks. But uh, this is like the perfect time to do hot drink. Ooh, that's hot too. Wild mint grows almost, well not everywhere, but like beachy areas and lakes. So I'll let that steep. Have some tea and uh, Throw some sugar in there to get my calories back and have some goat. Giddy up goat. Goat. It's a pretty hot goat. Who wants a piece of that goat? Oh, it's good. Look at that. Tender. It does look good. I'm just gonna move this because our rice time is up. Dude, that's as good as beaver meat. Is it? I don't believe you. Okay, not quite as good. It's pretty good though. Who wants some of that? Anybody want some goat meat? I want some goat meat. You want 6,000 calories of goat meat? Yeah. You need to get a little silver barrel spoon. Sorry to bone. It's a pure fat, man. Yeah. All right, we'll let that, we'll let that come out. The broth. It's almost halfway civilized. Like if you're if you're actually watching this, eat. Oh yeah. <laughs> Took a couple of British explorers with their white tablecloth, but the <laughs> silverware. <laughs> it actually does look like a table. <laughs> this is the bin. Your mom here. Oh, thanks. More like uh, Japanese. Yeah, <laughs> just a small scale. Yeah. Very efficient. Sugar for me. All right, as you guys know, I read all your comments so far. But eventually I'm going to lose track of that. So what I've started to do is write down, or at least mark out the most common questions that keep showing up over and over again so that I can address them to everybody that watches. So. We'll cover a couple here right now. Um, somebody asked, do or a few people asked, do you ever get sick from eating wild foods? Have you ever got sick from eating wild foods? Yes. Which one? <laughs> the uh, delightful minnow stew. <laughs> That's true. Do we ever get sick of eating wild foods? <laughs> no. Yeah, I guess the minnow stew did make us sick. You got or sick the of pike. Or the mushroom. Yeah, but sick of pike. Sick of pike, but, but it didn't make pike. us sick. But the minnow, yeah, we woke up the first day of the Wilderness Living Challenge Season 2 in the middle of the night. And I don't think we made a big deal about it because nobody really pointed it out. But I was up at like about 2 or 3 a.m. And I was trying my best to puke. I got about a handful, like this is a great table talk, but <laughs> I got about a handful up and that was it. And then I just wrote it out. And then the next morning I felt really tired because I obviously hadn't slept, but I felt fine to yeah. enough to continue. And you woke up and you had the runs. Yeah. It's a great mealtime talk. Yeah. You had the runs um, quite a bit. Yeah. And then you kind of felt... the night and then... And then you felt fine but tired. By the afternoon the next day I was okay. But truth be known, we only had maybe like a sip or two sips of the minnow soup. So we think maybe it might have been mushrooms... And Jeremy was saying that, what you thought some of them weren't perfectly... You in perfect condition. Not in perfect condition, it's like some of them were partly rotted. So, yes, we have, but otherwise, no, we haven't got sick from eating any of the meat or anything else, really. 
No, but it's because we're really careful about our hygiene. <laughs> well, that's the next question. <laughs> Somebody asked, what do we do about our hygiene? Look at my hands. Do they look clean to you? They shouldn't because they're, they're dirty, right? You don't wash your hands when you're out in the woods, do you? Do you bring soap? Snow. Yeah, you I did not bring soap. <clears throat> I, mean, I, I never I bring. I should be admitting that to. I never of bring. Of people. I never bring soap. I come home dirty and I'm fine, right? We brought soap uh, in season one. I remember that. You brought soap. Yeah, we both. Oh, used you it. brought soap. I never used it. No. You, you had a shower. You had a bath <clears throat> in the lake. In the lake. And yeah, I, that's true. I, I don't. Did. I don't swim in cold water, so I don't. I'm not going to do it until I get home. <laughs> yeah. So. I don't. I don't wash. I don't wash. My hands are dirty, and and yeah. but the thing is that this, this kind of dirt's not going to make you sick, right? No. It's like we're like it's just you, like soot from the fire. It's grease from the goat. Yeah. I mean, if your hands, if you had clean, if we cleaned an animal or gutted an animal, yeah, we would probably want to wash our hands. But we, if we don't have soap, we just kind of you just wipe it on a tree. Yeah. You wipe it in snow. Yeah. You put your hand over the fire to to heat them up after because it's really painful to wash your hands that way. Yes. Um, in the summer, you just grab a handful of sand and just scour your hands. Yeah. Right? I don't do anything more than that. You use your pants. And then you wipe it on your pants. And then when you get home, you wash your pants. <laughs> yep. And it's all good. And, and, okay, so that might lead into the next question, which is, do we ever attract wild animals with our habits? Uh, no. Oh. Mice. I've had mice yeah. run across me in the night. Uh, mice and, like, raccoons, I haven't had. I actually haven't had, like, knock on wood. I haven't had trouble with bears, wolves, raccoons, humans. Humans. No troubles. No. Well, the thing to keep in mind about animals is they're scared of us. We are the top predator. So even black bears that we see, they run away every time. You know, it might not always happen that way, but... I had once one run right at me. Right, he was up north and one and one did that to him, but it wasn't because he had food. It was because you. Because there was food. He was concealed, and and the bear, kind of snuck up on you, right? I made a noise and it thought maybe I was something to eat. Did you grunt at it? No. Nope. I sang a little song. Hmm. But it eventually took off. Yeah. And it wasn't because you were leaving food everywhere. You were just walking. No, around. no. So, yeah. the fear of animals is hugely overblown. Hugely overblown. And the people are yeah. coming, making comments about when you see a bear and it, there's snow out. Well, bears don't hang out in the snow. They, they go hibernate. So, you know, we might see a wolf here, but wolves don't attack people. And can, you think you and I can take a pack of wolves? Like, with well, one arm tied behind our back. <laughs> we, we, have, we could use tools, so... No, I don't know about that, but well, a pack of determined wolves we're, could probably take us. We're, we're sliding into the realm of fantasy now. Exactly, because wolves are not—they don't. Wooded beardsman's people. eyes glaze over. <laughs> He's imagining fighting a pack of wolves. You got my trusty Groma knife. Your coexist bumper sticker. <laughs> really? Yeah. How many people ask about that? A lot. Oh. Yeah, they want to know if you think it's a joke. They want to know if you th you take it for real. They want to know if. Or take it for real, if, if, or you know what the story. So here's the backstory of the coexist bumper sticker. Uh, it was on the car when I bought it. <laughs> it was a used car. So basically, you it got, had the sticker. You guys got trolled. <laughs> and I never took it off. <laughs> so it's totally meaningless. It's just J Jeremy's laziness. So yeah, you, if you want to send me a cool bumper sticker, you go over top of contact it. Contact me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right beside. <laughs> Start a collection <laughs> wherever the deer haven't broken my bumper up. Well, this is coming up more and often because I guess a lot of Americans are watching, especially the bone marrow video I, I made where the people say that they knew I was Canadian because we have accents. Yep. Do you, do you know we have accents? You do? Yeah. <laughs> I never thought I had an accent. Nope. Well, you do. Totally. Yeah, I guess because more, more when I hear other YouTubers that are Canadian, I'm like, okay, that guy's Canadian. Yeah. You can kind of tell, right? Yeah. But... There's a lot of people that I would presume have like stronger accents than Canadians do. I guess yeah. we say A and... And the stronger their accent is, the stronger they think your accent is. Right. Yeah, we don't really say about. Really weird, I think. No. 
Is it, people say we say abood. <laughs> we say about. I don't know. Some Canadians do maybe, but I guess Americans would say they they say about, like yeah. about. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I don't think we have an accent, but apparently we do. You ever seen Sasquatch? Yep. <laughs> I didn't think you were gonna say that. You haven't really. No. Have you ever thought you saw one? Uh. I, I can, I for sure never had any inclination that there was a Sasquatch. No Sasquatchiness, eh? No, never. So. I've heard some really crazy night noises, but it's always been just like birds that you wouldn't expect or... Yeah, it's always an animal. There's always a reason, right? Remember when we were paddling in the dark to go duck hunting and there was like a weird... Yeah, there was a weird sound. Like a berry yawning or like a... Yeah, it was like a, a weird stretching or moaning. Like a, it was a weird moaning. It was weird. But it I've might never, have been a Sasquatch. It might have been a Sasquatch. People like to play tricks on their own selves, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so this is the last one we're going to say. Um, Stevie Ray, username, who writes, I love to be in the woods, but it makes me nervous. What's the trick to not panic at every branch crack and other noise I hear? Because well, there's probably a lot of other people out there in the same kind of boat where they're kind of scared, right? Especially on solo stuff. Yeah. I would say if you're scared to go in the woods, don't go solo. No. Yeah. For starters. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think like the more often you do it, the more often you realize that 999,000 times out of a million, it's a chipmunk. A small animal. Yeah. A bird. Yeah. It's an animal that is not dangerous, put it that way. Right? It's yeah. true. Like, there's always a reason for the sounds you hear. And it's 99.9% .9 not a big predator because predators are extremely rare. And big predators aren't out to get you. They're pretty much minding their own business, doing their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, and avoiding you if possible as well. They're avoiding you, yeah. Like like I said, we have, I've, I've seen bears. I've paddled up to bears on the shoreline and the bears basically take off through the woods as fast as they possibly can hitting yeah. everything yeah they basically cannot get out of there fast enough they run through all the trees and the brush yeah and you're like what the hell was that like you'd be scared and there's a couple times i would hear a bear climb a tree like i'd hear something run off and i'd hear claws up a tree oh, yeah so i knew it was probably a cub or something like that so i yeah. knew enough to stay away because there's probably a mother nearby but yeah um i guess just Realize that you're a top predator. Because yeah, we think, really are. And I think a really good thing is, like, if you hear a noise, you train your brain. Like, just be curious about it and think about, like, what could make that noise. And then go and look. And, you know, it's probably a chipmunk. And then at least in your brain, you now you start to associate certain noises with chipmunks, with squirrels. Like, guys who sit in tree stands long enough, they... Well, you see everything. Usually, you can tell the difference between a squirrel running and, and a deer. deer walking and a... Yep. Robin scratching in the leaves and a black squirrel or a yeah. rabbit hopping. Like they all sound a little bit similar, but you can train your brain. But if you're, if you just always get worried, yeah. your brain doesn't learn. And I think an interesting thing too, is when you're camping at night, a mouse can sound a lot bigger than it really is. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> right. When everything's yeah. still and quiet, yeah. a mouse can sound like a raccoon. I can sound like a bear. Yeah. You know, and anything bigger than that, like a raccoon can sound like, you know, something bigger than it really is. Most of the time, it's just something really small, but it gets amplified because you're obviously scared and then everything's still and quiet. Because I've had, I've had, you know, mice wa walk around and I look out and I can actually see it's a mouse, but it seems like to me, it would be like something the size of a rabbit. Yeah. Moving around at night. Yeah. And, and they do move around at night too, but they're usually quieter. But the mice, they, they're scurrying through the ground or the underbrush so you can hear them so that's i mean that's my advice right yeah you go with that too yeah yeah have you ever been scared of anything yeah i was sleeping with my tent open one time and uh i heard heavy breathing right by my ear <laughs> not right by my ear the animal was probably 10 or 15 feet away but like big snuffly breaths and i thought for sure it was a bear and i actually just froze i couldn't 
make myself breathe normally. I couldn't make myself roll over and even look. All I could think about was what could this possibly be? It must be a bear. And listen to the big snuffly breaths of this animal. And then it, and then it stopped. Do you know what it was? Yeah, I went out, there were moose tracks. It was a moose. It was a moose. Wow. Uh, but your imagination will always go to, oh, it's a bear. Right. If it's something on the ground, oh, it's a rattlesnake. <laughs> something in the tree, it's a cougar. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, my uh, brother-in-law, we went camping when we were younger, and he had the same thing happen to him. He had food in his tent, and this was at a, a public campground, so it was, you know, it has, it, there's lots of food around, basically, so there's animals all the time there. And he woke up, like, it was a, just before pre-dawn, just about light out, and he was screaming and screaming and screaming, there's a bear, there's a bear, there's a bear, right? Yeah. And he had his pillow and he was jamming it up against the front door. Well, because he had food in there, he basically attracted a raccoon. Yeah. But he was freaked out because he thought this like sniffing animal was like a bear sniffing at his doorway, right? So he immediately went to, you know, it's going to be a big predator, but it was just a <laughs> raccoon. So, yeah, he freaked out and it woke us all up and... We walked out and we didn't see, we didn't see what what it was, but the um, people camping next to us, you know, obviously saw, saw, they were, you know, they were woken up too and they saw the you raccoon saw run away. Yeah. I actually did get woken up one time by a bear fighting a dog outside of my tent. Um, but that was a very special circumstance because we were tree planting and we were camped out very close to a municipal dump. Uh, and we happened to be in a bear travel way. And just because of, because we were in a really bad location, we actually saw bears every day we were there for five days straight. Yeah. Bear, their bears are very common in dumps. Yeah. We went to the They're dump very just to go look oh, yeah. for scrap and for scrap metal actually one time and it was like dusk. It was kind of stupid. Yep. And there was, there was a bear and there was somebody else came to look for the bear. So oh, yeah. they like yelling at us, there's a bear behind you. <laughs> So actually my wife was with me, Courtney, and she starts running. I'm like, don't run. And she was running. So I'm like, oh, I guess we got to run. I can't be the only <laughs> yeah. one walking. Now you got to outrun her. <laughs> yeah, now right. I gotta run. So we just, I just ran as fast as she did. And I like, calm down. And, and then we actually <clears throat> turned behind us and the bear actually was going perpendicular to us the opposite way, running from us, running from it. Yep. So the bear had enough instinct and, and normally yep. they do, you know, unless an animal's cornered, they're pretty much... They're going yeah. to be scared of people more more than the other way around. Yep. So that's a long answer, guys. Yeah, that was a really long answer. <laughs> that was a really long answer. Right. You'll have to pare that one down. But hey, you guys are joining us for our meal too, right? So, Cheers, guys. Hey, you're going to throw some wood in this fire. Ah, it's cooling off a bit. water. Jer! Jer! I'm in the water! <laughs>